science knowledge only adds to the excitement and mystery and the awe of a flower. Evidence is evidence. It's public. Everybody can look at the evidence and assess it and eventually, if there's an enough evidence, come to the same conclusion. Cockatoos with attitude. Cockatoo. Hi, and welcome to Cockatoo, Cockatoos with Attitude, episode 15. How not to turn your bird into a cruise missile. And I'd like to introduce you to our number one former cruise missile. Yep, yep, he's never been to Pakistan or Waziristan or any of those places. But um, he definitely is a former cruise missile. Now, when he was relinquished to us, he had a number of issues, but and we'll go over all of those because this, this episode is really about salamander. We call him Sal, but... Uh, but he is one of his main issues, which is uh, being an adolescent, you know, when they reach three and a half, four years old, uh, what they tell you at the bird store, which is, uh, oh, this bird will always be this way, you know, because they're friendly, cockatoos are friendly, uh, social. We think of it as friendly, but they're social. So they'll tell you, oh, this bird will always be like this. But in fact, that's not the case, and it's especially not the case if they've been improperly handled. Sal was kept loose. Uh, he was either taken around to various places uh, on a constant basis, or just let have uh, run of the, the apartments that he was in. Isn't that right? Is that right? Are you sure? Yeah, okay. As long as you agree. So he was let have free reign, and then on top of that, he was improperly handled. He was petted anywhere below the neck, and if you pet a bird anywhere below here, uh, that's actually an, a sexual advance. How does this guy think he knows? Is it experience? Does he have psychic powers? Or is it just a gut feeling? Scientific research? You're kidding me! Many people have asked how I know the things that I believe that I know. And one great source is this book, The Manual of Parrot Behavior, by Andrew Lusher. It's it's a compendium of what we know uh, about parrots. And one thing you'll notice, if you look at a book and you're trying to determine whether it's going to be useful for you, if you look at the, reference at the references at the end of each chapter, you will see that all the studies and the, the abstracts, the information that it's drawn from are listed here. So you can go back to the research for our episode today, uh, episode 15 of Cockatude, deals with not turning your bird into a cruise missile. And one of the big issues, uh, the place where I found the information that I have since been able to show is true here, on page 215 it gets into mate-related aggression. And I'll read a little bit of this. I, I highly recommend that you buy this book. You'll choke when you find out how much it is. The last time I looked, I think it was $140. Obviously, only a select number of people are going to buy this book, which is why it's expensive to produce. But the information you find in here won't be like any information you find elsewhere. You'll be able to corroborate that information. Parrots are prone to developing unhealthy pair bonds with one of their owners. While the bird may bond to more than one person, only one is chosen for a mate. However, if the chosen mate is the only one who ever handles the bird, the aggressive tendencies will be much worse. Mate-related aggression occurs most commonly in hand-raised birds of larger parrot species. Amazon parrots, macaws, cockatoos, and Quaker parrots are all commonly affected. 
Male birds are most often affected. The behavior often begins or becomes more serious at sexual maturity or during breeding season. So in this episode where I'm talking about Salamander getting to that age where he is becoming an adult and he's got that sexual urge up, as the book says, it becomes more pronounced at those times. The aggression will most often occur in situations where the bird's favorite person is approached by someone else, such as another family member. The aggression may be directed toward the rival or, paradoxically, redirected toward the favorite person. So, I have said before that when you're in a situation and someone comes up to you that is showing you some kind of affection and the bird turns around and bites you, that's not out of the blue. That's made aggression. So if you pet a bird improperly, and if you do things to get that bird to mate to you, you may be setting yourself up for a bite, and also setting your friends up for that same situation. Occasionally, an inanimate object such as a telephone, or a cavity such as an open drawer, may trigger the aggression. Unlike most other types of aggression, these birds will often attack or chase their victims. They are often exceptionally cuddly at other times, at least toward their favorite person. So I highly recommend that you buy this book and that you read it. Now, if you don't want to read it from cover to cover, you can actually look in the back in the index or you can look at, at the topics in the contents and decide what you need to read under a certain circumstance. Always best to know beforehand, though, because if you are petting a bird improperly, you're probably going to find out the hard way that you made a mistake. So this is one book you should definitely have. What are you doing back there? Hi, is this time to introduce everybody? This is Roman. That's our Roman bird. And Peaches. Hi, Peaches. I heard you say hi, Peaches. And this is Salamander. And up out of you we have... Sugarbird. She's up there watching everything from her high perch. So, I've limited the number of birds in here so that he'll spend more time over here. He likes to go play by himself, which is unusual for uh, cockatoos. If there's too many birds in the room, he will tend to gravitate to an area to play by himself. So, to get him to, to, uh, give us the honor of hanging out with us, we have to limit the number of birds in the room and the ones he's most comfortable with. That's very nice that you're doing that to the back of my neck, little boy. It is. What are you doing? You trying to eat me? Are you? Hello. Hello, sweetheart. Hi. Hello. So, he was petted improperly. He was taken from place to place. He was not given a solid base at home. He didn't have, he had a cage, but he wasn't required to go into it for any particular time. He slept outside of the cage. And because he wasn't given any grounding, he didn't have a particular cage that was his territory. Even though he did, he didn't. Um, for that reason, he was kind of a loose cannon. And then when he went as far as to decide to become an adult, um, because he was being petted below the neck, he, and he was not being given any particular rules to live by, he started actually running and attacking the lady who had him. Now, it isn't that he's aggressive. He's not. Now, if you look, you'll watch. If, after I've been holding him for a while, you'll see what he'll start to do. Right now, he's trying to get my attention. After a while, he'll start hitting me with his beak. That is a, um, a mating signal, and you have to deal with it by not allowing it. He gets a little too friendly when he's held, and so you have to limit the amount of that that he does. Um, I also have to deal with the fact that I have a camera over in the area that he normally likes to hang out in, so uh, I may have to actually stop for a moment and move that camera. But it's a good angle to catch him in. This is cute. What we see is cute behavior, the way he's moving his head. Did you see the way he just tapped me with his beak? This is not something you want to encourage. If you notice, I'm not giving any, any special encouragement. Now, if he continues to bang on my arm, I have to stop that behavior one way or another. I have to distract him. 
Because if I don't distract him, he's going to start getting frisky. And if he were to become mated to me, and uh, then the rules of parrot mating apply. And if you aren't familiar with those rules, you definitely don't want to become familiar with them by experience. These are the kind of rules you want to learn about mm, from books and uh, ethologies by people who deal with these birds and study them in the wild. Um, you want to look at how behaviorists see those, those particular things. Because if you don't, um, I'll give you a good example. I read in an article last year, up in Los Angeles, uh, a gentleman had two people break into his house. And they were, they had him on the ground and they were, they were hitting him and they were going to, they were obviously going to rob him. That's what they were there for. So, hi Roman. No, I can't give you all the attention right now. I can pet you a little bit. Um, they were going to rob him. Well, his macaw, uh, seeing him being attacked like that, his macaw dove down and proceeded to remove one of the eyes of one of the, uh, assailants. In the wild, about the only time you see true aggression from these guys amongst themselves, parrots or cockatoos, is when there's a dispute over a mate. So because this bird's mate was being threatened and actually injured, um, this macaw came down and removed the eye from one of the assailants. This is normal behavior protecting their mate. You would expect them to protect their mate. So if you become mated to a bird, I'm not saying you're going to lose your eye. That doesn't happen very often. Um, I don't know of any other actual instance of it, but I've seen lots of pictures where people were bitten in the face or had, you know, tears on their lips or that kind of thing. And those particular bites are not aggression. They are generally mate territoriality. People get their birds mated to them by petting them improperly, by allowing them to do mating signals. He stopped doing those signals, if you notice. Now he did just did one again. He's tapping on my hand. If you are enjoying our videos, we hope that you can find it in your heart to support our work. It costs between $25,000 to $30,000 a year to care for our flock of heartbroken and abused birds. Most of our birds came with feather destructive disorder. Even a basic exam with blood work costs $300. Medical emergencies cost us thousands a year. We are a nonprofit and donations are tax deductible to the full extent of the law. We need your support. Birds deserve a happy and healthy life. Become our patron at www.patreon.com slash Chloe Sanctuary to support us on a per video basis or donate at our webpage today. I was giving him a little attention and looking at him, and that, that, that'll tend to get him going. I mean, he's got to figure he's like a 13 or 14-year-old human. I mean, he's got those hormones raging, so... And he will for a while. I mean, he's, he's an adult, but he's going to keep looking for a mate. And right now, I'm the only one that looks like I'm... Hey? Now he was grabbing my finger gently with his beak. That's another mating signal. Um, you don't want him to get into that habit. So what I'm doing is just kind of taking him up and, and moving him around so he loses. He's not losing his balance, but he's just not as steady on his feet as he would normally be. It's just a way of taking away his, um, his focus on what he wants to do. So if you learn how these birds establish a mate bond, and you avoid doing the things that will cause a mate bond, then you won't have a bird that will 
come across at you like a cruise missile. And he really did. He would fly across the cages in the main bird room. I mean, he just soared across the cages, moving as fast as you can imagine, right towards her face. And I remember one time when I didn't think she was going to be able to move away from him fast enough that I ran a couple of steps over and threw my arm out there for him to, to step up on my arm, which he did. <clears throat> Because we have more of a student-teacher relationship. Um, I'm not sure. I'm usually the teacher, but sometimes it works the other way around. Um, and she was aghast. She couldn't believe that I would put my arm out when a bird was obviously coming over to be aggressive. Um, but I didn't have any fear. Uh, and it's even if he'd bitten at me, it wouldn't have mattered. But I didn't think he was going to. Um, the main thing was that... I had to stop him from that behavior, and he generally listens to me. I wouldn't say all the time, but I'd say he's pretty good. Ninety-five percent of the time, he listens. We have a good, we have a good relationship. I love him; he Hello. loves me, but we don't take it too far. We don't get into any interspecies kind of um, hanky panky. Well, with peaches, I I had to preen her tail section because she couldn't, and she did have some abscessed follicles and. It was a mess back there because nobody had done it. Nobody had preened her there. Uh, in the process of preening her tail section, she now considers me to be her mate, so I have to be careful that she doesn't exhibit any mate territoriality with other people. Generally, she won't. Uh, it's, it's generally with her own species. Uh, she doesn't care to have sugar anywhere near me. Did I say sugar? I did. Hi, peaches! She doesn't even like me to say Sugar's name. Do you, Peach? Yep, yeah, now she goes, turning around, coming over to me. I wonder why you're doing that. Could it be that I said that name? Hello. Hello, baby. Could it be that I said that? Could it? Yeah. So the first thing is you don't want to pet them improperly. The next thing is when they start exhibiting behaviors like knocking Hello. you with their beak or fanning their tail or rubbing their beak on your arm, these are things you need to discourage. And you don't need to like put them in their cage because they're not misbehaving. These are natural behaviors. You just need to discourage it from getting out of control. Hello. And sometimes, hi Peaches. Hello. Roman bird, you want to get on my lap? Thank you. And you want to get on this hand? Thank you, that way I can kind of keep her from screaming. Uh, one way to discourage this behavior is simply to move them from hand to hand. If you if, you, if they're on your right hand and they're banging their beak against you or rubbing their beak on you, uh, or a female is turned tail and is, is pressing up against you, you just need to generally, the first thing to try would be to move them from one position to another. Like As with him, if I were to take him, move him from this hand to this hand, and then back to this hand, just the movement back. Wow. Now he's looking at his play area. He's thinking, I want to go over my play area. And there's a camera there. Yes, there is, sweetheart. There's a camera there. So moving them back and forth from hand to hand is good. Putting them on a perch that's close to you, you can do that. You can put him up on a perch. Come on back. Come on, cutie. There you go. So putting him on a perch, taking him back down, get his attention on something else. Um, you can give them a toy and have them play with a toy. As long as they don't start playing with the toy like it's a mate. You don't want that kind of behavior going. So if they get any toy, if they start treating as if it was actually a mate, as if it was actually another bird that they're mated to, um, then you wish is to exhibit any behavior like a male would put his tail up around the, uh, the toy and possibly like sitting on it. Uh, a female would usually turn up against the t uh, whatever it is and press against it. So these are the kind of things you want to discourage. Change out the toy. Get a toy in there they'll play with, but that they don't treat it that way. Hi, Roman. Hi, beautiful. What you doing? Yes, yes. You were an awful, terrible bird, weren't you? Yes, you were just so mean. Everybody said you were awful. They just thought you were the most awful bird. But you're a good boy. Yes, you're a good boy. And you're a good boy, too. Now, other ways you can discourage it, if you know, pending that you're not just a single person and you have another person in the home that is working with the birds, 
You can make sure that they only have food for the first two hours or three hours of the morning. And, and the same thing for the afternoon in the wild. They tend to not to forage, except uh, at those oh, times of day that are early morning and ah! just before the sun goes down, a couple of hours before the sun goes down. So I think perhaps they're smarter than us because the lack of food in their environment will usually make them not interested in, uh, in mating. So that's another way to reduce it. Uh, getting them uh, things that they can play with. Again, the toys are good. Um, but becoming observant, actually watching what they do and learning what certain things mean um, is, is critical because if a bird is actually displaying any kind of mating behavior. Oh, you had to go, huh, boy? Okay, I'll just a second. Right there, Roman. I gotta get the towel. Ah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Easy, Roman, easy. Hey, cutie. Well, come here. Well, come on. You miss it up there? Okay. Hi. Did I get your tail? Did I get your tail? Did I get it? Did I get it? Now, when I'm doing this, I'm getting his attention, but I don't want to get it too strong, so I'm letting him walk away. <laughs> so, the key is to learn what their body language is, to learn uh, about how they behave in the wild, and apply that to not becoming their mates. So, that's, that's the number one key, reducing the amount of food in the they get their food in the morning and in the afternoon, and if you can do that, uh, I say that that's for people that have, you know, that are human pair bonds. You don't want them to starve, and that could happen if something happened to you. So, so that's, in a nutshell, that's what to do. Now, if you already have one that's pair bonded with you. You need, and you have other people in the environment, you need to take a tray of treats if you don't know what their favorite food is, have them a couple of times pick something off that tray, put a whole bunch of different things on it, and whatever item they take off from the tray that they consistently take is their favorite. Don't let them have it any other time except when you're training them. Now what you need to do, since they're focusing on you, if they're pushing other people away, which they will sometimes do, as uh, people do when they get married, um, they tend to push away all the single people. So in order to break that, you then take that treat and you have, let's say, your husband or your wife, uh, whatever significant other you have, um, an older child in the house in their teens, give them the treat. And you don't give them the treat, you give them, they give them the treat for stepping up for them, or for doing a dance for them, or some particular sets of behaviors. And what that does is they learn that other people are in the loop too, not just you and them. So you can start to break that. And you should see a trained behaviorist. Um, if you have issues and you can't figure out how to deal with them, you can take classes. Um, you can go to behaviorworks.org and read what Dr. Susan Friedman has to say uh, about dealing with uh, behavior. And you can study applied behavior analysis and become a trainer. That helps. Uh, really don't think it's an easy thing to live with these guys unless you have some basic tools of training. And would you say peach? I love peaches. So those are all things you can do. Now let's talk some more about uh, Sal here. Uh, when he was brought to us, we were told that he had a uh, twisted spine and that he had seen a veterinarian and that x-rays had been done. Well, we just recently had someone uh, give us the money so that we can have the x-rays done. And it turns out he does not have a twisted spine. Instead, he has a twisted pelvis, as you can see in this picture. And you can see how the way one leg comes out normally and the other one comes out at a 90 degree angle from where it should be. And because of the way his pelvis is twisted, his whole back then appears twisted. But it's actually not his spine that's the problem, it's his pelvis. 
There's no way to know from the x-rays and the examination we had done whether this was due a congenital defect, something that he was, you know, that he already had as he formed in the, inside the egg, or if it was something that happened early on, but we do know it's been there for a long time. And since he's only you know, four years old, it kind of makes sense that it was something that happened before he was at least a year old. Yeah, he gets along pretty well. We tried him on Medicam uh, for pain, but we didn't see any change. There was no change in his behavior at all. So uh, we don't see any reason to give it to him. We'll have to keep an eye on him because he could develop uh, arthritic conditions from this. And so he needs to have those yearly exams. And, and he's going to have to have x-rays more than most birds to see if he's developing that. And if he does, we'll have to put him on the Medicam just to try to slow that process down. <clears throat> because arthritis could be, you know, it could be a fatal disease for him, uh, the way he is. So, he doesn't seem to be in any pain. He's missing one toe. I don't know if you've noticed that. He's like, he's like the parrots in the movie Rio. You wonder if those animators had a brain at all. Because <clears throat> parrots always have four toes. That's what zygodactyl means. Two toes back, two toes forward, and they have a grip like we do. They have the opposable toes so they can pick things up. He has three, he's missing one. We don't know how that happened, but he gets along just fine. Don't you, Sal? Don't you? Yeah? But you know you're on video or what? Usually you're off over to your play area. You don't like just sitting on a perch. You like to play. Yeah. I know you. Well, I know you. I do. Big cute thing. Now, he had some behaviors. Uh, he, he plays dead. He'll do sit-ups. He, uh, he likes to be tossed, all these kind of things. But we limit that to once a month, so he remembers the behaviors. But we don't work those behaviors. And the reason we don't, we don't want to get him to get too excited because excitement can bring up that urge to mate. And if he gets mated to me, then we got a problem. You don't want a bird that can crush a macadamia nut in one crunch with his beak mated to you. Um, and a good example of that would be sugar. I don't have any videos of this because generally when it happens, I'm kind of busy trying to make sure that she doesn't hurt somebody. She'll, hi, sweetie, what are you doing? What are you doing? You want to go to your play area, don't you? I know. I promise you can watch your movie. Um, when somebody comes over, if they're talking to me, she'll, she fluffs up, she gets her, her crest all the way up, and she approaches, and it most people would just think, oh, that's really cute, but it's not cute at all. Because actually what she's doing is threatening whoever it is. Um, I spent a lot of time getting her uh, healed. You know, many, 13 different collars, a bunch of different toys that I built that I with, used uh, um, rare earth metal magnets to hold them together so she could wear them on her neck. And if she got caught somewhere, they would come right off. I spent a lot of time healing her, so she doesn't want anybody getting too close to me. She doesn't seem to mind when birds do it, but she minds if anyone else does. So, uh... so the other thing that's odd about him is that he does not like to be preened. If you notice, when I try to approach his head, he turns away. He doesn't mind if I approach him this way, but he doesn't like you to preen his head. Now watch what happens if I try to preen him. Okay, I get to get him kind of nailed to me. And then, if I'm really cautious, I made a point of making sure there were some things to preen today. Um, I've got to be cautious. The notes, there he goes. He doesn't like to have you preen. I've never seen a cockatoo that doesn't like to be preened. Now, I know that he was shown off to people constantly, so he may just not want to be shown off. And... Uh, Maybe he was hurt when somebody was preening him. I don't know. But 
just to get in there and get his feathers because he <laughs> bites you all the way. <laughs> he doesn't mind you touching it. He just doesn't want you <laughs> preening those feathers. Now, if you don't know how to preen a feather, he's the worst one to show you that on. But basically, you there's a, uh, there's a keratin sheath that comes around the feather as it's growing. So it'll come out kind of looking like a... Like the, the quills they used to they used to use to uh, to make pins from way back in the around the turn of the 19th century. So that's what they look like, and you have to break them off because they can't on their head. And that again is why you can generally preen a bird on their head, and there's it's not a sexual advance. But if you preen them somewhere else, anywhere below that point, then it is. You're silly. Well, I got some of them. I got some of them, Ma. Yeah, I did. I did. But this is what you deal with. It, it, if something were to happen to me, anyone who tried to preen his head is going to be told no just multiple times. They say no to me again. There he goes. See? But yet, if I hold him like this, he's just fine. He likes to be held. He likes to be talked to. He doesn't like to be shoved in people's faces, but he does like to, uh, to exchange with people. Um, he's still a little iffy with, with, uh, outsiders. He's doing much better than he was as far as socialization goes. Now, another issue we have with him. Hi, Roman, where are you going? What you doing? Hey, Roman bird. Um, another issue we had with him when, when he came here was he had Poop that was about the size of a quarter or less, which is way small for a Moluccan like this. A Saram cockatoo is probably a better uh, description or a you know, salmon crested, but uh, he had this tiny, or and it was orange. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Um, never seen orange poop in a bird before, but got him on a new diet. He loves the mash that we make here, and he eats the rowdy bush too. Um, not usually on the same day. Some days he'll eat the mash. Some days he eats the rowdy bush. He kind of chooses, and some, some days he'll eat them both. And uh, he'll eat the mash in the morning and the pellets at night or reverse that. But now uh, his poop in the morning, especially in his cage, is the size of a dollar bill. I mean, this guy really, he really goes. And uh, his weight's good. He stays... Right around uh, 1,010 grams, no, right around two pounds, close to two pounds. Um, he's got all three elements in his poop. He's got the green fecal matter and it holds to its shape. He has the, the urates, which are, in his case, are, are just like uh, milky white, which is good. It can be milky white or yellow, depends on the bird, but uh, and then urine, you know, he has the, the clear liquid that comes with it, and they're in the equal proportions, and it's all good. When he first came here, I was afraid that, you know, he had serious problems. His CBC came back normal, all of his, his vitals were good, but that poop was unacceptable. Uh, poop like that indicates there's going to be a health problem, so look at that. You going to grow that toe back? Are you going to grow it back? You're not? You're not? Hmm? Now he's looking at me like this because he knows that I don't generally hold him for more than about 15 or 20 minutes at a time, max. And that's because of his uh, adolescence stage, because he's got the I want to be a mate going. But um, we can show you a couple of his behaviors. He doesn't do them very often. As I say, we don't want him to do these um more than once a month, and he hasn't uh, he hasn't had them done in the last two weeks, so we're going to go ahead and, and show you what that looks like. Bang! Oh, did you die? Now, what happens after you die? you got to exercise, right? Okay, do setups. Want to do setups? Come on, let's do setups. One, oh, guys, come on. One, and two, and three. Now see, now see, this is what you don't want. Now, you notice how he gets all fired up? this age, you don't want to fire him up too much. So now the method I'll use to calm him down generally is just put my hand on his head and, and just get him to my chest a couple of times. Come here. Come here. Are you okay? You all right? Okay. Yeah, you have to 
be careful not to get him too excited. Yeah. Woo-hoo. Baby, you say, you say, I love you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, I generally teach every bird to say, I love you for a reason. Uh, it's awfully hard for someone to hit an animal if it's saying, I love you. Uh -huh. um, although they seem to be able to do that in marriage as well. Uh -huh. Hello, Peach, is that you on the floor again? What are you doing down there, Peach? It's all right, Rome. Come here. So he's learned to say I love you. He doesn't say it that frequently, but uh, a bird that says I love you is less likely to be to be hurt. And, and since they live such a long time, uh -uh. you have to prepare for the eventuality that uh, that bird is going to need to, to be with someone else. And whoever that person is um, may have issues. One way to get around those potential issues is to teach them to say something that is endearing to others. He does have a, a number of good phrases. He says, hello. He says, hi. He says, hi, baby. Yes, he does. And he makes his jungle sounds and usually follows it with hello. Don't you? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? You're a very real bird. Yes, you are. Yeah. Now, it's not th this relationship that he and I have, which is which is not a mating relationship, is difficult. It's not easy to stay close to him without getting mated. Because of his twisted pelvis, he can't fly, or he doesn't seem to be able to. He can flap his wings a little bit, but he can't really get a good rhythm going. So, uh, Unfortunately, that means he's not getting as much exercise as we'd like to see. Without flight, they don't get much exercise. Uh, there was a paleobiologist who did some research. Hi, Peaches. Hello. Hello, Peaches. Hello, Peaches. Hello. Hello. Who did research trying to determine what the uh, advantage of having feathers Hello. would be if you weren't actually flying, and uh, they were able to determine that that little extra lift could help a bird go up a hill a little faster. Could, In other words, it might just give it that edge over another animal. A bird uses only about 10% of its metabolism to just move around unless it's flying. To get up to 100%, we're talking about flight. So there isn't much exercise, if you can imagine, if you went into the gym and only used about... If you could say you could bench press 100 pounds and you only use 10 pounds, you wouldn't be getting much exercise. That's not a true analogy, but it's close enough to get the idea. So if you can get a bird to fly, that's what you want to do. In his case, it's not going to happen. Um, there is no surgical procedure that's going to help him. We just try to keep him as active as possible. And we're going to watch to make sure he doesn't develop arthritis. Uh, if that does happen, or he starts to show signs of it, then he's going to have to go on an anti-inflammatory for the rest of his life. Okay. Medicam could cause organ damage over time, so we, we would prefer he'd not be on that anti-inflammatory unless necessary. So keeping a close watch on that. So to sum up, he's an adolescent bird. We have to keep him from mating. He likes to eat mash and rabbit bush, but not always on the same day. He stays around um, anywhere from 1,000 grams up to 1,200 grams from time to time, depending on his uh, state of mind and whatever else is going on in there, huh, kid? We only... Let him exhibit his behaviors about once a month because we don't want to overexcite him while he's going through you know this uh, hormonal period of life 
He likes to play with toys. He's particularly fond of his his toy center. Aren't you? Yes, you are. And it's funny because he has some toys dangling up there that don't have, they just have a couple of pieces of wood on them. He's more interested in sliding the little pieces of plastic back and forth. He actually doesn't like the wood on it. He takes the wood off so we can play with the plastic toys. There's a first. Not seen that before. His poop looks good. He's he's eating well. Uh, we just have to keep an eye on him to make sure he doesn't uh, get arthritis and keep him interested in the world. Uh, we are working on trying to make him a little bit better about being preened. He doesn't like to have his head preened. It's funny that I can touch him here, but he doesn't like to be touched there. That's just uh, an odd behavior, but they're all, as my uh, as my mentor, Susan Friedman, would say, every bird is a study of one. So that's cockatude for today. How to keep your bird from becoming a cruise missile. And this is Sal. Salamander, Sal. Hello. Commander, Salamander, yeah. You want to say something to the people before we go? You want to say something? You want to say something? Do you? We'll see you next time. We welcome your feedback on our videos. We look forward to your insights, tips, questions, stories, and pictures. You can email us at cockatude at chloesanctuary.org, reach us on Twitter at sign Chloe Sanctuary, and join with us on our Facebook Chloe Sanctuary page. We hope you will consider supporting us on Patreon today. Patreon was created to enable fans to support and engage with the artists and creators that they love. Empowering a new generation of creators, Patreon is bringing patronage back to the 21st century. This is how it works. We produce up to two videos a month. As a patron, you pledge to give us a donation. Whatever you feel is right and meets your budget. And Patreon gives us your gift monthly. You can easily set a limit on how much you donate a month. You can change the amount of your pledge at any time. Your gift will allow us to continue bringing you entertaining and informative videos. Some of our planned videos are Quality of Life How using a quality of life assessment saved Sugar's life, how it can help your bird and offer you peace of mind. Home exams, how to do a home exam quickly, efficiently, and properly. Early detection saves lives. A new paradigm, what it means to be a parrot owner. An interview with Dr. Jeffrey Jenkins of the Avian and Exotic Animal Hospital. The Adolescent Bird How Not to Turn Your Bird into a Cruise Missile The Real Story Behind the Birds and the Bees Who is Training Whom Behavior Training and How to Empower Your Bird to Make Good Choices in Our World As a Patron, you can also choose to be in the Producer's Circle, the Director's Circle, or the Advisor's Circle. Each donation level has benefits. The producer circle helps to choose the next video we create and may help with scripting. The director circle influences which birds are in a video and gets to choose how some of the sequences are shot. The advisor circle makes suggestions for the directors and producers to consider. You can find out about these on our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Chloe Sanctuary. We look forward to your participation in Cockatude.
such a science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower.